Good morning. Good morning. I know that we advertise that we start at 9.15, but we have so much to cover this morning that I'm going to take the liberty of beginning early. Um, since I preach short at 8 o'clock, and we start, we end it earlier than usual. Let's pray. For, this is from the Book of Common Prayer on page 828. It's a prayer for families. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who sets the solitary in families, we commend to your continual care the homes in which all people dwell. Put far from them, we beg you, every root of bitterness, the desire of vainglory, and the pride of life. Fill them with faith, virtue, knowledge, temperance, patience, and godliness. Knit them together. In constant affection, those who in holy wedlock have been made one flesh. Turn the hearts of the parents to the children, and the hearts of the children to the parents, and so enkindle fervent charity among us all, that we may evermore be kindly affectioned one to another, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Well, good morning, everybody. Good morning. As promised, we will... Uh, get started, I'm sorry to say, about a minute or two early, just because we have so much to cover. We have been going over all of the sacraments, and so today we arrive at the sacrament of holy matrimony. So let's take a look at scripture and understand that as we go through our discussion today, I'm taking the, uh, there is a, uh, taking the traditional perspective of the church. There's been some changes, some proposed, mod or not proposed, but some modifications that are upcoming starting Advent 1. <clears throat> because I want to look more so at the theology of the sacrament of matrimony, I'm not going to get bogged down in the details of some of the de recent developments until we get to the very end if we have some time. So just know that from the outset. So, if we look at sacred scripture, where do we first see whole, where, where do we see the notion of the two being one flesh? Adam and Eve, right? Genesis chapter 2. The Lord God then built up into a woman the rib that he had taken from the man. When he brought her to the man, the man said, This one at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. This one shall be called woman. For out of her man... This one has been taken. That is why a man leaves his father and mother and clings to his wife, and the two of them shall become one body. Now, the story of Adam and Eve, we do not necessarily take as the literal way in which God created humanity. Uh, science seems to point us in an obvious and different direction, and that's okay. But what this tells us is that the union of a husband and a wife does go back to the very beginning origins of our creation. It's part of who we are. Can you tell by this picture where in scripture I'm headed next? I don't know if you can see it very well. I turned off the lights for up here so we can try and see this a little bit clearer. I don't know if you can see what's going on in the, in the photograph. What is it? Yeah, the wedding feast at Cana. On the third day there was a wedding in Cana in Galilee. The mother of Jesus was Jesus and his disciples were also invited to the wedding. Can you imagine the bride and the groom, what that must have been like for them? You know, they're inviting Jesus, and Jesus has this band of, of people. And understand that in these times, weddings were huge celebrations. Weddings went over long periods of time. It wasn't just a, a single day event. Um, so Jesus and his friends show up at this wedding. And what happens at this wedding? The first miracle, turning water into wine. Who asked Jesus to help out? Yeah, Sean Vicker said it. Mary. Mary said to Jesus, Yes, son, look, they've run out of wine. Can you do something about it? Right? So Jesus' first miracle was at a wedding. In the Gospel of Matthew, we read Jacob the father. This is the genealogy of Jesus. Jacob, the father of Joseph the husband of Mary. Of her was born Jesus, who was called the Messiah. What we see in this little snippet of a long genealogy is that Jesus was born into a family. He was born into uh, 
the life of Mary and Joseph, who were married to one another. Anybody figure out what's happening in this painting, this classic? Joseph's dream. What does it tell me about Joseph's dream? What, what's happening here? It's okay. Angel's telling him what? It's okay. Not to divorce Mary. The angel is saying, don't be afraid to take Mary into your home, right? When Jesus' mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph, but before they lived together, see, there was, a, there was an extended period of time. That engagement was kind of a first step in the, in the right of marriage at that time. And so this was when they were betrothed. They were by law married, but they weren't yet living together. She was found with child through the Holy Spirit. Joseph, her husband, since he was a righteous man, yet unwilling to expose her to shame, decided to divorce her quietly. Such was his intention when, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary, your wife, into your home, for it is through the Holy Spirit that this child has been conceived in her. So this notion of Jesus entering into humanity through a woman is a powerful testimony about the sanctity of, of the feminine, the sanctity of womanhood, the sanctity of childbirth. That's the way that God so chose to enter the world. Jesus very well could have just walked out of the woods one day on the scene. Without a mom, without a dad, he could have inserted himself into the world in any way that God so chose. But God so chose to come into the world through a woman. But not just through a woman, but through a family, through a married woman. A woman who was married but yet still had not had the experience of, of um, of being with a man. We go to Ephesians, and St. Paul has this to say about marriage. Be subordinate to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives should be subordinate to their husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is head of his wife, just as Christ is head of the church. He himself the Savior of the body. As the church is subordinate to Christ, so wives should be subordinate to their husbands in everything. You don't want to take a picture of that slide, Annette. That'll get me in, that'll get me in trouble. I take a picture of you. Oh, there you go. So you kind of go, oh, wait a minute, hold on. What is this deal? Wives, be subordinate to your husbands. But that's not Paul Harvey's rest of the story, is it? Husbands, love your wives. Even as Christ loved the church and handed himself over for her to sanctify her, what did Christ do for the world? What did Christ do for the church? He sacrificed himself. He suffered and he died. That's the depth of love that husbands are to have for their wives. Cleansing her by the bath of water with the word that he might present to himself the church in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. That she might be holy. Husbands, love your wives so much that you make her holy in some way. So also husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one hates his own flesh, but rather nourishes it and cherishes it, even as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak in reference to Christ and the church. In any case, each one of you should love his wife as himself, and the wife should respect her husband. In summary, according to this passage, the husband is called to be the head of the body of the family. The wife is called to be the heart. When we take a look at what this means theologically, Brent, uh, Brent Petrie, who wrote Jesus the Bridegroom, does the best way, puts it in the best way. He says, Christian marriage is a living icon of the sacrificial, sacrificial spousal love between Christ and the church. It is, or it is supposed to be, an outward sign of the invisible mystery of Jesus' love for his bride and the bride's love for him. If we're doing marriage right, then we should reflect the love that Jesus has for the church and the love that the church has for Jesus. That's a deep love, right? Right? 
I mean, that's a powerful love, right? Yes, it is, and it says, a sacrificial love, right? Sacrificial means what? That you put the other before yourself, right? Right. Yes. So, in marriage, as in all of Christianity, it's not about me. It's about the other. What do we have around here at Emmanuel that we talk about all the time? Little S, big O, right? Key Parker has his button on today. Thank you, Key. I need to wear mine more often, frankly. Here and at home. Who's in there now? No. I'm just kidding. It was a rhetorical question. I knew who said that. <laughs> When we take a look at the current Book of Common Prayer and we investigate what is holy matrimony, it's quite clear. Let's read this together. Holy matrimony is Christian marriage in which the woman and man enter into a lifelong union, make their vows before God and the church, and receive the grace and blessing of God to help them fulfill their vows. Anything stand out in here to you? That it's a lifelong union, right? And we make our vows before God and the church, not the church building, right? We're making our vows in front of the church community. We're saying that we want to enter into this sacrament as a living icon of the sacrificial love of Christ and the church, and the church for Christ. This is a pretty deep thing. When you look at the rite of marriage in the Book of Common Prayer, and you read that section that begins it called Concerning the Service, this is what it says. Let's read it together. Christian marriage is a solemn and public covenant between a man and a woman in the presence of God. In the Episcopal Church, it is required that one, at least, of the parties must be a baptized Christian, that the ceremony be attested by at least two witnesses, and that the marriage conform to the laws of the state and the canons of this church. Solemn, public, uh, in the presence of God, that you have to have at least one of the bride or the groom be a baptized Christian, right? Doesn't even say Episcopalian, does it? It says a baptized Christian. That the ceremony have at least, at least two witnesses. I inherited a wedding one time when I was stationed down in Louisiana and um, the bride and groom, they had everything set. They had already met with the priest, but the priest was ill and I had to take his place. And so as we were preparing for the wedding, I asked the bride and the groom, I said, uh, how many people are in the wedding party? And the bride said, eight. I said, oh, well, that's beautiful, four and four. She goes, no, 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 eight on each side. I said, my God, who's invited to the wedding? I mean, who's gonna be in the pew? There were 16 people who were witnessing this thing. You can have 16, you don't need 16, but you do need two. And my personal requirement is that they be two sober individuals. <laughs> I went with uh, Allison and, and the girls who went out to the shopping area yesterday, and the only place I could find a bench to sit while they were uh, in one of the stores was outside of David's Bridal. They had uh, <laughs> young girls, they were walking in, and I heard them laughing and said, one of the bride said, I am going to have to pace myself on the wedding day so that I'm not so tipsy when the wedding ceremony starts. And I thought, oh, are you kidding? That does not agree with Solomon, does it? No, it doesn't. We have to take the ceremony seriously. Otherwise, what does it mean? Then it becomes, frankly, a farce. I had a question. Oh. Yes, sir. Why only one baptized Christian? Why not both? Are they saying just baptized Christians? Two Christians? One baptized, one unbaptized Christian? You can Christian? have a baptized Christian who's Christian. married to an agnostic or an atheist okay. in the church. It's not required that both of them be Christian, but at least one of them be Christian in order to enter into the sacramental nature of the church. This is the unofficial answer I'm going to okay. give you now, okay? I think it's because we want to bless that marriage and hope and pray that grace infuses that relationship and draws that non-believer into the love of Christ. Huh. Okay. I mean, 
That's how the Roman Catholic Church grows every year. You know? You got a Catholic who marries a non-Catholic. Pulls them in. That's just, that's just a joke, Mom. Huh? I imagine my mom now watching on, on YouTube at home. So, let, let's go back to something that we talk about often in these classes, right? Lex Romney, Lex Credendi. What does that mean? We should know it by now. What we pray is what we believe. What, the law of prayer is the law of belief, exactly. What we pray says something about what we believe. And what we believe says something about what we pray. So what I did was, I opened up the Book of Common Prayer and went to the marriage rite, which can be found on page 420, 423, right? And wrote down, typed up for you, so that you, in case you didn't have a Book of Common Prayer, wrote down the prayers of the marriage rite. Right. Pay attention to these words. Yeah, you recognize this? <laughs> I do. I had to point out to him that he was up there. I said, that's you. I this is, <laughs> there's Joseph. <laughs> that's not Joseph, that's Michael. That's Joseph. <laughs> Everybody gets you guys confused anyway. Right? That's it. Yes, it. <laughs> it's all right. I don't. No. Let's read this together. This is the very beginning of the celebration and blessing of a marriage. Let's read. Dearly beloved, we have come together in the presence of God to witness and bless the joining together of this man and this woman in holy matrimony. In the presence of God to witness and bless. Our presence is a blessing. Let's continue. The bond and covenant of marriage was established by God in creation. And our Lord Jesus Christ adorned this manner of life by his presence and first miracle at a wedding in Cana of Galilee. The fact that Jesus' first miracle took place at a wedding is of significance. It gave, uh, his presence gave um, uh, a sense of a blessing to the sacredness and the covenant of marriage. Let's continue. This, is, this continues our, the opening remarks that the priest or the deacon says, or the bishop. It signifies to us the mystery of the union between Christ and His Church, and Holy Scripture commends it to be honored among all people. This notion of the mystery of the union between Christ and His Church reveals itself again, doesn't it? So that's a theme that keeps coming over and over again. And the thing about this is, and the reason I'm doing it this way, is because when we're at a wedding, there are so many distractions, there are so many things being said, that sometimes we just kind of filter it out and we go into La La Land and we don't appreciate the depth of what is being said. These words, this prayer, is powerful. Let's continue. The union of husband and wife in heart, body, and mind is intended by God for their mutual joy, for the help and comfort given one another in prosperity and adversity, and when it is God's will for the procreation of children and their nurture in the knowledge and love of the Lord. So it's for our mutual joy. How many married people do we know that have no joy? Right? Yeah, don't raise your hand. I saw that hand go up and I just almost had a heart attack. I hope you have a question. <laughs> Slug them again, Sherry. <laughs> For their mutual joy. We all know couples that don't have mutual joy. Is that a marriage? No. I'm not sure. For the help and comfort given one another. The help. We're to help one another. Right? Whether that's putting out the trash or, or, uh, or helping in some other emotional or spiritual way. Help and comfort given one another in times of both prosperity and in times of adversity. When things are going great, we're supposed to turn towards one another and we're supposed to celebrate that together. When things are going poorly, we're in a moment of adversity, we are to lean on one another, not go to our separate corners and not hide from one another and not try to escape from one another. And when it is God's will, I've done numerous weddings uh, for some people who are of advanced, mature age. And um, 
I would say that uh, their ability for the procreation of children is not beyond the miracle of God, but just simply not likely. So you can have a marriage without the procreation of children necessarily. Let's continue. <laughs> Therefore, marriage is not to be entered into unadvisedly or lightly, but reverently, deliberately, and in accordance with the purposes for which it was instituted by God. You, Jim saw the picture before everybody else, I think, <laughs> right? You see the groom with his fingers crossed? I hope this works out. Marriage is not to be entered into unadvisedly, what does that mean? It means you need advice, right? It means you don't go into it lightly. You take it seriously. How many young couples come to me or to any clergy person and they want to get married here because it's a beautiful church? How many say, do we really have to do these classes? We know one another. We're okay. It's all going to be fine. That's not light. That's, that's going into it lightly. That's focusing on the day, uh, the, the wedding, and not the marriage. We are to go into it reverently, again, which I would define as soberly, <laughs> deliberately, deliberately, meaning that we can't have a shotgun to our back by the bride's father, perhaps, <clears throat> that's forcing us into it, but it must be deliberate in our own minds and in accordance with the purposes for which it was instituted by God. Then the priest says, if any of you can show just cause why they may not lawfully be married, speak now, or else forever hold your peace. <laughs> Name who? Yeah, the graduate, of course. Yes, there is a reason why maybe she should not be getting married, right? And then the priest says, I require and charge you both here in the presence of God that if either of you know any reason why you may not be united in marriage lawfully and in accordance with God's word, you do now confess it. So first, the clergy person asks the, the congregation, the people who are in attendance, hey, does anybody here know why they shouldn't get married? Yes, I know. They're brother and sister. Oh, well, okay. Well, there, there's a reason. <laughs> that was funny, right? Have you ever had that happen? Uh, no. I've never had anybody stand up and say, no. Um, but then we turn the, to the couple, to the bride and the groom. Do you know of any reason why you should not get married? You know, and the groom might say, yes, I'm in love with the bridesmaid. The bride might say, well, good, because I'm in love with the best man. Well, and then, you know, then you go to the reception, I guess, after that. <laughs> But even though these seem like mere formalities in terms of the questions, they are very serious. This, we are saying, I am coming here of my own free will, unencumbered, uninfluenced by anything other than the love of this person and the love of God. Yes, please. So on the lawfully part, if, you, uh, if, if someone did stand up and said they are brother and sister, what would you as the presider do? Well, if they said brother and sister, I'd say, well, it's a family reunion. So uh, I would probably uh, try to take the bride and the groom and the person with their concerns to the back and try to sort through whatever mess we suddenly have stumbled into and uh, try to determine if it, if it is in fact accurate. And if the bride and the groom said, yeah, we're brother and sister, I'd say, well, then you can't get married. I mean, by, by the law of the canons of the church, the law of consanguinity, which is the, the blood relationship to one another, uh, we couldn't go forward. We, we can't go forward. Um, so I would, I, we would cancel. We would cancel the wedding. Would, would there be any other unlawful circumstances? <coughs> any unlawful circumstances? I suppose if one of was married. What's that? The was already married. Yeah, uh, that's right. Allison was just saying, if somebody was already married uh, but had not gotten the divorce decree, um, that would be problematic. And, you know, remember, the presumption is that I, as a clergy person, have met with these individuals and investigated their previous circumstances. If somebody jumped up and said, he can't marry her, he's still married to me. Well, I'd look at the guy and I'd say, is that true? And probably by his body language, I would be able to determine if it was or not. You know? um, 
So we would Not have there. we would have to investigate it and go from there. What a mess that would be. The Declaration of Consent. This I found on the internet is a picture of a young couple that was preparing for marriage and a makeup artist, you might not be able to see it very well, a makeup artist tried to show them what they were going to look like as they aged and progressed in their marriage, right? That's kind of neat. Will you have this person to be your husband or wife, to live together in the covenant of marriage? Will you love him, comfort him, honor and keep him? in sickness and in health, and forsaking all others. Be faithful to him as long as you both shall live. The person says, I do. Love, comfort, honor, keep, no matter the circumstances. That's, that's, a, beautiful, that's a beautiful declaration, it's a beautiful <laughs> commitment that the spouses make to one another. And then, it's, this is the same thing as, as what was on the previous slide, then, the clergy person asks the congregation there, will all of you witnessing these promises to all in your power uh, to uphold these two persons in their marriage? The congregation, because it is a public ceremony, because it's being done in the midst of the church, the church has a responsibility and an obligation. It's not just some pretty party that's happening, but this is a vow that the, that the congregation is making to the couple. Hey, are you going to uphold these people when she comes running and banging on your door in the middle of the night crying because he's an idiot? Are you going to open the door and try to help her out? I hope so, right? Uh, when they win the lottery and they don't know what to do with all their money, are you going to help them out? I would think so. <laughs> so then we get into the ministry of the word, which are the scripture passages. And... This is the prayer that is prayed before we all sit down to hear the readings. Let us read this together. O oh, gracious and ever living God, you have created us male and female in your image. Look mercifully upon this man and this woman who come to you seeking your blessing and assist them with your grace, that with true fidelity and steadfast love they may honor and keep the promises and vows that they make. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. This man and this woman who come to you seeking your blessing, assist them, God, with your grace. Infuse your grace in them, Lord God. We beg you to help them, right? So then we have the readings, we have the sermon, then we get into the marriage ceremony. And this is where the priest or the bishop or the deacon has the bride or the groom repeat. He says, repeat after me. In the name of God, and the person says, in the name of God, I take you to be my wife or husband, to have and to hold from this day forward, for better and for worse, for richer and for poorer, in sickness and in health, to love and to cherish until we are parted by death. This is my solemn vow. These are the words that make a marriage so. And it's not because the priest is saying the words, or the deacon, or the bishop, but because the spouses are saying these words. Then, you ask the little boy that has the pretty pillow with the rings, he comes forward, bless, O oh Lord, these rings to be signs of the vows by which this man and this woman have bound themselves to each other through Jesus Christ our Lord. So it's a blessing of the rings. And why do we use the, symbol, the ring as a symbol? Unending. Unending. Has no beginning, has no ending. And that's the kind of love that God has for all of us. Exactly. It's unending. And then the bride or the groom repeats after the priest, I give you this ring as a symbol of my vow. And with all that I am and all that I have, I honor you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now that they have given themselves to each other by solemn vows, with the joining of hands and the giving and receiving of rings, I pronounce that they are husband and wife in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. 
Again, it's not what the priest has said that causes them to be married. It's what they have said to God and to each other. Those whom God has joined together, let no one put asunder. So then we get, into, we get into the prayers, right? The prayers of the people, we call it at our regularly scheduled Eucharist. And the reason I put these up here is because of lex orandi, lex credendi. Because the law of prayer is the law of belief. Again, by the time you get to this point in the wedding, you've been crying, you're ready to get mo moving towards the reception. There's still prayers to be said. And these prayers are so powerful they're so beautiful in the way they express the intention and the purpose of marriage that I did not want to skip over them. Let's read this together. Give them wisdom and devotion in the ordering of their common life, that each may be to the other a strength in need, a counselor in perplexity, a comfort in sorrow, and a companion in joy. It doesn't get any better than that in terms of the ideal of marriage and what marriage is all about. Give them wisdom and devotion that they can order their common life, that they can be of one mind, one heart, one soul, moving in the same direction, which hopefully is towards heaven. Strength and need and counselor and perplexity, a comfort and sorrow and a companion and joy. If they don't have these things in their marriage, it's not a good, healthy, or holy marriage. Let's read this one together. Grant that their wills may be so knit together in your will and their spirits in your spirit that they may grow in love and peace with you and one another all the days of their life, that their wills may be so knit together with your will. Can you imagine such a thing? Jan, you want to sit next to Vicki? You can sit right there, dear. There you go. Thank you. That's okay. That their wills together might be knit together with God's will. Let's read again. Give them grace when they hurt each other to recognize and acknowledge their fault and to see each other's forgiveness and yours. We know that in marriage there's going to be hurt. We know in marriage there's going to be many opportunities to apologize to one another. And the sooner someone can learn how to apologize and receive an apology, the healthier the relationship will be. Now I found this next little thing on the internet and I like it. Just wanted to offer my deepest condolences on having to be in a relationship with me. <laughs> I'm so sorry you have to be in a relationship with me. Let's read this together. Make their life together a sign of Christ's love to this sinful and broken world that unity may overcome estrangement, forgiveness, heal guilt, and joy conquer despair. What is that prayer acknowledging at the very outset? Just, just throw it out there. The imperfection of the world. That there will be problems at what? Ten? Imperfection of the world. Imperfection of the world. That somehow this marriage is to be a sign and a testimony to the world. That when we're walking through Walmart or, or Safeway and we see a, a couple who are married together and we see how they interact and you go, wow, look how absolutely loving they are. It's a powerful testimony. It gives us hope. But we're not supposed to just go out there looking for those people to give us hope. We're supposed to be the hope for those of us who are married. I had a job once at a cancer treatment facility in Louisiana, and they had lots of volunteers. The cutest, most adorable, most loving older couple, probably in their 80s, always walking around holding hands. I was so enamored by them. And I said one day to the volunteer coordinator, I cannot begin to tell you 
what it does to my heart to see this beautiful couple holding hands and volunteering together here. How long have they been married? And the woman, very embarrassed, said, oh, they're not married. I said, oh, well, that's still cute. How long have they been together or dating or whatever? No, they're, uh, they're both married to other people. I went, what? Oh my gosh! I mean, all of the, all of the hope, the sign that it was to me had come crashing down. But it, 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 it taught me a valuable lesson. I mean, I saw something in that that, um, that woke me up. That we can't always assume on the outside what's really at work on the inside. So we have to be gentle with ourselves and with one another and not be too quick to make too many judgments, either good or for ill. Look how cute, Look how cute our little goddaughter Maggie. Mm. Bestow on them, if it is your will, the gift and heritage of children, and the grace to bring them up to know you, to love you, and to serve you. Give them such fulfillment of their mutual affection that they may reach out in love and concern for others. This prayer suggests to us that a marriage is not supposed to be turned inward only on itself, but that if I'm fulfilling my spouse's needs and my spouse is fulfilling my needs, that we are at such a place of mutual affection and joy that then we are to turn together outward, that that love that we share is to go outward into that broken, wounded, and sinful world reaching out in love and concern for others. Grant that all married persons who have witnessed these vows may find their lives strengthened and their loyalties confirmed. Again, putting it in other words, everybody that's here, may they derive some kind of joy from this ceremony, from witnessing these vows. May they, may they be emboldened and strengthened in their own marriages and in their own relationships. Grant that the bonds of our common humanity, by which all your children are united one to another, and the living to the dead, may be so transformed by your grace that your will may be done on earth as it is in heaven. Where, O Father, with your Son and the Holy Spirit, you live and reign in perfect unity now and forever. One of the important parts of this prayer that I really like is, O Father, you live and reign in perfect unity. God, as Trinity, is in and of himself a relationship. There is something happening within God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And that serves as a model for us when we come together as one in marriage. So then we do the blessing of the marriage. O oh God, you have so consecrated the covenant of marriage that in it is represented the spiritual unity between Christ and his church. Send therefore your blessing upon these your servants, that they may so love, honor, and cherish each other in faithfulness and patience, in wisdom and true godliness, that their home may be a haven of blessing and peace. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Where do you hear this? Anniversary. That's our anniversary blessing. Isn't it a beautiful prayer, Donna? I love that prayer. I mean, it's so succinct and it, it, it just it speaks volumes. So, after communion, we then have a special post-communion prayer at a wedding. Let's read this together. <clears throat> o God, the giver of all that is true and lovely and gracious, we give you thanks for binding us together in these holy mysteries of the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Grant that by your Holy Spirit, now joined in holy matrimony, may become one in heart and soul, live in fidelity and peace, and obtain those eternal joys prepared for all who love you, for the sake of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. That they may become one in heart and soul, that they might live in faithfulness and peace, and obtain the kingdom of heaven. These prayers, these words that we kind of gloss over during the wedding ceremony from time to time are deep and spiritually significant. Can we
we imagine a world and a church, a wedding ceremony that we take all of that so seriously that it comes to fruition? I can't. I take all this stuff so seriously. And again, it's part of the reason why we have to do the preparation in advance of the wedding day. That we don't just say, hey, you know, well, we don't really, you don't want to get, you don't do preparation, you don't have to do preparation, it's okay. <laughs> just come on up, we'll sign the document, you'll swap the wing, we'll swap the wings. I sound like the guy from The Princess Bride. <laughs> and I should have gotten that clip and put that up here. <laughs> So, what's the matter in the form for holy matrimony? The matter in form. What, what do you have to have in order for people to be married? A uh, bride and a groom. You have to have a bride and a groom. And then they have to say the words. The, and I don't think it's I do the wed. I think it's the, the other words that, that we use, right? Who effects the sacrament at a wedding? Who makes the, the marriage happen? The bride and the groom. The bride and the groom. Remember, it's not what the priest says, it's what they say that, make, that makes the uh, sacrament effective. And so who can then witness the sacrament? In other words, the person who would guarantee the church that they did it appropriately. The priest. The priest. Bishop, the priest, or in some instances, a deacon. So holy matrimony in 2015, I found this cartoon I like a lot. You got an elephant in a psychiatrist's office, and he says, I'm right there in the room, and no one even acknowledges me, right? <laughs> All right? We have to acknowledge that the Episcopal Church has moved forward on approving same-gender blessings and marriages. I'm not opening the floor to debate about whether that is right or whether that is wrong. It is a reality within the Episcopal Church. How it's going to unfold here at Emmanuel or in our diocese is yet to be determined. But it will require lots of prayer, lots of respect, lots of mutual understanding. Um, I don't know how to... Um, I don't know how to put to words what it is that I'm, I'm, I'm trying to get to, but this is something that's going to take some time, and it's going to take some uh, prayerful consideration, and just know that there's no one meeting down our doors at Emmanuel right now to have me or anyone here perform a same-gender marriage. It's, it's, not, it's not happening. Um, when, that, when we get to that point, I have shared with the vestry, that we will look at each case individually and that we are going to, uh, I'm going to adopt a policy of treating any couple the same across the board. I had several months ago a woman that called and said she and her future husband were driving in front of our church and they loved our church and our church was beautiful and she wants to get married here. And I said, oh dear, okay. When? Oh, in three weeks. We've already got the, the reception hall book. I said, ma'am, that's not going to happen. You need to be a member of our church. You need to be a member of this congregation and this body of Christ so that we can support you and, and celebrate this sacrament. And it takes about six months of prep time for me to meet with the couples and walk through all of the necessary stages of preparation. So that's an example of a straight couple that came looking for a wedding here, that I said, no way. That's not how we do this. That's not going into this deliberately, prayerfully, and, uh, and consider, you know, considerately. I also had a friend who asked me to do her wedding. She and her husband have uh, been married for a long time. Um, but when I was a Roman priest, they asked if I would, I would do their wedding. And I said, you know, I, I gotta tell you, I will do your wedding if you go to church, if you go through the preparation with the priest, and get properly prepared, then yeah, I will, I will do the wedding. And I knew that they didn't go to church, that church was not ever going to be a part of their lives. I still loved them, I still cared about them, I still attended their wedding as their friend, 
But I, in good conscience, as a priest, as a representative of Christ, could not stand before them and say that they were duly prepared and, and ready to be a sign of the love between Christ and his church to the world. Um, that's not where they were. So even my close friends, I've declined on doing weddings. So I take my responsibility as a presider at any wedding extremely seriously. So, I know that might sound vague, I know it might sound non-committal, uh, but it's the reality of where I am right now. And I also think it's the reality of where we are as a church parish. Um, you know, I, I, like I said, I don't have any same-sex couples coming to Emmanuel who are seeking marriage. So, if somebody came to me today, and they were in fact a registered, active member of our parish, and if I had to give serious consideration to it, it would be quite some time before we would ever get to that point where a decision would actually have to be made as to how we're going to approach this at Emmanuel. All over the floor to questions. <laughs> You're like, come on. <laughs> no, nope. I'm like, please don't. <laughs> You know, the, the, the fact remains that we have folks on both sides of the issue uh, in this church and in this room. And so I want to make sure that when we have conversation and dialogue about it, that it is done with respect for all sides. All sides. Um, and sometimes that's, that's hard because we get passionate about, about our, our beliefs and, and, uh, and that kind of thing. So, But I did not want today's presentation to be about the elephant in the room. And that's why I went through the prayers and the Book of Common Prayer. Because I wanted to talk about marriage as an institution. Holy matrimony as a sacrament, regardless of who the bride and the groom happen to be. So, um, so I'll leave it at that then. Well, thanks everybody for your attention. I'm welcome. Uh, I welcome your questions. You can talk to me in person. You can shoot me an email. You can give me a call, and I'll be happy to try to address your concerns as uh, much as possible. But thank you so much for your participation. What's next Sunday? What's next Sunday? Oh, thank you. Reconciliation. The sacrament of reconciliation. People don't realize that we have confession in the Episcopal Church, but we do. And our little slogan is, all can, some should, None must. Thanks, everyone.